Um, man, I'm, I'm, I've been excited for this series. I told you for a while. We launched it last week. And we talked about how much more, how much more. And uh, if you're watching online or, or you happen to miss it, you can go back and watch it on our Facebook page. Uh, pretty soon, too, we're going to be launching our YouTube page. We're going to start streaming to YouTube, streaming to the website, creating just more ways for uh, this uh, th- this room, right, th- the gospel message of Jesus to get out. And, uh, and we're going to do that soon. But you can always get caught up. And I would encourage you to do that because last week um, I really set the table uh, for this week and also next week. It'll be a three-week series. And uh, part of me is like, was when we're looking at the sermon calendar, we're like, wait, but next week is after Thanksgiving, and traditionally you have to start the Christmas series, the Sunday. Out. I'm like, you know what? I think Christmas series can wait one more week. I think it's going to be okay if we close this out and then, uh, and then move into our Christmas series in December. And so uh, th- we have this week and one more week of how much more. Um, but I w- again, I would encourage you to go back and listen if you, if you didn't have a chance. And we talked about the difference between how much more and less than. Less than versus how much more. And the reality that Jesus often used this teaching style of how much more. So he would say, hey, if the world would offer you this, how much more would your Father in heaven offer you this? But we broke down the difficulty and the tension that usually what is right here and right now is often less than and how much more is found typically over there. And it was time spent, and it takes effort, it takes time, it takes work. So we broke this down on a larger scale. And this week, I want to dive in, and I want to speak around this idea of how much more. If the world offers you this, how much more does Jesus have for you when it comes to our finances? And so we are going to talk about money in church today. And, uh, and, and whenever somebody says that, there's always these sort of lies that spring up. There's sort of these tensions uh, that arise. And, and, uh, and I'm going to do this. Before I even dive into anything having to do with money, finances, I'm going to speak to some lies in the room, okay? And these are all lies that I have heard in conversation uh, that come up uh, that, that, that attack people when it comes to hearing good biblical teaching when it comes to our finances. These are lies that the enemy wants to put in our hearts, put in our minds, uh, to try to keep us from receiving what God wants to do today. Uh, the first lie uh, that I've heard from people often is, man, if, you know, the, the Jesus I serve wouldn't ask me to give my money. Like, I, don't, I just don't see Jesus as the kind of guy who would ask me to give. He wasn't a guy that was about money. The tension there is that Jesus actually talked about money 25% of all of his recorded teachings, 25%. So this is my first sermon I've talked about money in our church, and uh, this is my 52nd sermon. So I'm one of 52. So what's that? Is that, what is that? That's a little under 2%, a little under 2%. And he did it 25% of the time. Jesus talked consistently about this. And we'll get more to why would he spend so much time on that. I think it's an important question that we need to answer. Uh, Another thought, right, we've all heard this phrase so many times, the church just wants my money. The church just wants my money. And I'm going to be really, really honest with you. Uh, At the end of the day, what we see from Jesus and what I want to do as as, as a pastor of a local congregation is that this is not a conversation about funding the initiatives of the church. And if we approach today's message and with Pastor Sam has an agenda to try to fund initiatives, uh, why did we not even talk about what we're giving to you? It's very intentional because I don't want us to approach this from uh, we, he's trying to get us to give so that we can accomplish X, Y, and Z. At the end of the day, this church really believes that Jesus wants your heart and that we practice following Jesus. And a part of giving Jesus our heart as a part of that in order for me to be able to stand one day in front of God and be accountable to how I led this church, part of our heart in order for it to be given to Jesus, we have to talk about money. This is a part of it. So more than us wanting money, we're saying, hey, actually, we really believe uh, that we, we want to have hearts that are towards serving Jesus. And, um, and, you know, another thought often is like, well, you know, if the church, if the church was really so good, the church shouldn't cost me anything to be a part of. And the reality is, here's what's so funny. It doesn't. It doesn't. There's no entry fee. We didn't charge you. In fact, we're giving you Artisan Under Lights for free. Like, it's a blessing to you and your family. Go find another place where you can ride a magical train for free. Like, <laughs> like, like, like show me another place where, 
there's, there's so many free opportunities for your kids. Show me another place that babysits your kids for free, like for free so you can go on a date and, and you don't have to pay, right? Like, like the idea that the church shouldn't cost us anything, the reality is it doesn't, but I don't find myself participating in any other community in my life without be commi- uh, being a part of it and, and having it cost me something. Uh, if we want to be a part of, we're, you know, we're a part of the Andover sports scene with w- Willa playing basketball. That costs something. I don't think twice about that. We're a part of the YMCA. That's a community. I don't think twice about paying to be a part of that community. We think about your hobbies, the hobbies that you love, the things that you get community, maybe around hunting or, or, or maybe golf or, or whatever it might be. Um, you're, 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 you're okay. And it's going to cost me something to be a part of it. And the reality is the word of God. I love what King David said. Hey, I don't want to sacrifice anything that costs me nothing. And, and the reality of community is community gets special when you start to contribute to it. And what's funny is I don't even see family as free, like my literal physical family. Family gatherings, it's like we're all bringing stuff to the table, right? You get together at Thanksgiving this week, you probably have your list of what you're bringing to the table, right? Because that's what it means to be a part of community. Hey, we all contribute. But the beautiful thing about church is you can come for free as long as you want. But I believe that if you're going to follow Jesus, a day comes where he asks you to contribute. And so today I want to speak to people who have a heart to contribute and are okay with that. Um, the other reality is, um, right, so, so these things, the enemy wants to come and he wants to lie that like, hey, this is, this is only about that. And if we could just strip that away and, and we could just approach this topic from a place of, man, I, I want to learn how to be more like Jesus. I want to learn how to be healthy. I want to learn how to give more and more of my heart to Jesus. And, um, and so I'm, we're going to dive in. And there's like 30 other lies I could address, but for the sake of time, I'm actually going to keep moving, and maybe we can j- address them throughout the message. And I'm going to sit down for a lot of this message, just so you know that's very intentional, because there's so much content, and, um, and I actually want to help us understand what I would call, again, a biblical theology of generosity. So I actually want to take us in uh, sort of a flyover view of what does the Bible say about generosity and the reality that generosity is central to this story. This is not something that you can sort of just avoid forever. This isn't something that you can just sort of um, cut out from the story and the narrative. And um, the reality is there's one very free gift that we get as Christians, and that gift is salvation. It's a free gift. But then after that, a life of faith costs us stuff. It just does. And the the more we're willing to be generous, the more we're going to get out of this life of faith. And so uh, let's start with a parable of Jesus. Let's start with a parable of Jesus. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. And we're going to go to verse 13. We're going to go to verse 13. Um, Last week I was preaching out of Luke chapter 12 as well. And this is just a little bit before this. And um, starting verse 13, someone in the crowd where Jesus was teaching said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Essentially, Jesus here, somebody comes to him with a real issue. He comes to a real issue. Hey, there's an inheritance, and I feel like I'm not getting my dues. I feel like I'm not getting my fair share. This is a real issue, and Jesus uses this as a moment to teach, like, hey, your focus is on the wrong thing. Your focus is on the wrong thing. You see, in my kingdom, it's not, it's not how much should I get. It's how much should I give. Uh, it's, not, it's not about coveting possessions and trying to hoard as much as I can get. You know, one question that you get all the time and we're not gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time on tithing today, you know, but it's so interesting where, where we'll do this with tithe. of like, are you sure I have to give 10%? And yet when you get around the teachings of Jesus, you realize he's saying, hey, the wrong question is, am I supposed to give 10%? The right question is, is how much do you want me to give, God? Over and over again, Jesus goes, hey, I, the, you're, you're approaching this wrong. You're approaching with how much of this inheritance should I get? And I'm going to challenge you with, you should be asking questions about how much should I give. And we'll get more into that in a moment. And so he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. 
And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, at face value, we hear this parable and we're like, oh, okay, so like, like don't, don't get too big of a savings account. Okay, cool, that's, that's it. I got to make sure I give. But I want to actually help us understand that this parable is central to a biblical view of generosity. Because what Jesus is addressing here is the human desire to uh, store up treasure, store up goods, store up money, because when we have a moment where there's actually an abundance of possessions, we're going, oh, let's store this up, because what if tomorrow I don't have it? Is He's actually speaking to this human nature inside of us that has a fear about tomorrow. See, we store up when we fear tomorrow. We store up when we're scared that it might run out. We store up from a place of fear going, I just don't know what it's going to hold, so, so i gotta, I got to hold everything. And I'm going to build bigger barns, and I'm going to build bigger storehouses. And the reason this was important is because when you understand the narrative of Scripture, going all the way back to Genesis, here we see a good God establish the reality that he is a giving God because he creates this phenomenal, incredible planet full of incredible resources. And he says, hey, Adam, I'm giving it to you. It's yours. You have dominion over it. All the resource richness of, of the Garden of Eden, of this planet, it's yours. Take it. I'm giving you dominion. Uh, uh, here it is. And he gives them this unlimited, untapped resource. But as we know that the story goes, Adam and Eve, they fall. They start to question beyond it. They start to question, what, uh, well, what is some of these greater meanings? I want to try to test some things. I want to I try to take this into my own hands. So the one thing that God said I can't have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I'm going to take the one thing that I can't have because I, I want to try to learn. And, and they have this wrong heart. They fall. And then something happens. We see right after that, immediately you see this picture of Adam toiling. All of a sudden you see this picture of Adam now having to work really, really hard to produce crops. And what begins to happen is for the first time there is temptation to be scared of scarcity. So all of a sudden, resources don't feel unlimited. All of a sudden, it's not just a garden producing all the good things that we want, and all of a sudden he has to put in work for it. And then that story translates to his sons, Cain and Abel. And, and we know that they toil and they work, but then when they produce crops, they actually bring an offering to God. One brings his best, one brings his first fruits, the first, the best of everything he produces, saying, God, I trust you with next year's crops. God, I have faith believing that you are a God of abundance and that the scarcity won't befall me, so I'm going to give you my best. Abel brings his best, and what does Cain do? Cain actually brings less than. He still makes an offering. And right there, something gets established because God actually doesn't reject Cain. He just rejects the offering. He just rejects the offering. He says, hey, I don't, I don't receive that because you didn't bring your best. Your heart was focused on the scarcity that might befall you. Your, 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 your heart, I, and I honestly, I would. Think back. This is like, like, like this is, they, they have to produce everything for them to eat, right? There is no modern society, Okay. I don't think he was going, I'm going to short God. Ha, 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 short God. I think there was probably a, I just don't know if there's going to be enough. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my worst forward, and I'm going to keep my best because I'm worried about next year. And so what, what, what one son did was say, God, I trust you with next year. What the other son did is says, I'm going to trust, I'm going to store up. And here comes in this human problem in the area of generosity, this desire to take care of ourselves. This desire to be afraid of scarcity. This, this, this reality of going, I just don't know what next year will bring, so I'm going to take care of myself. And I'm going to give God something. I'll bring to the food drive for Artisan Under Lights. 
I'll be generous, but really at the end of the day, when it comes to me and my home and my finances, I trust myself, and I trust my barns, and I trust my storehouses, and so I'll, I'll be generous, but you can be generous and not have God's spirit of generosity inside of you. Because the human element that's, that's plaguing the local church, I believe, in so many ways is this reality that we are still afraid of scarcity. We are still like these sons going, oh, I just don't know if there's enough. I just don't know if there is going to be enough. And then we see God, what does God promise to Abraham? He says, I'm a God of abundance. And if you'll receive this, your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore, seashore the, the stars in the sky, and, and Abraham gets it. And how many of you know that he, he continued to be provided for, and he continued to expand and grow, and God's hand was on him. And then you continue tracking with the Israelites, and what do they do? They start to forget that God takes care of them. They're wandering in the desert even, and God provides uh, right, manna from heaven. God provides so much, but yet time and time again, the human nature of, well, I just don't know about tomorrow. I just don't know about next year, so we're going to store up and we're going to depart from this. And so here we have a generous God desperately seeking to bless his people, going, hey, I've got resources, I've got more for you, but I'm really, what I'm going after is your heart. And your heart is in trusting yourself, not in me. You see, the, the typical Hebrew mentality leading up to the time of Jesus considered the problems that they were facing around generosity as a mindset towards God was the issue, not a lack of resources on earth. They, they really would have thought, hey, the issue is whether or not I trust God. The, the issue is do I actually truly trust God in this area or am I stressed about the resources, right? I think about right now, and everyone's advising, do all your Christmas shopping early, right? Don't trust that the shipping containers are going to come. <laughs> like, don't trust that there's going to be enough toys on the shelf in a month. Buy now, buy now, buy now. You got to get, don't trust the system. It's all broken at the moment. And sometimes we feel that same sense of urgency of, I got I to gotta take care of this. I got to handle it now, and I have this fear. So what ends up happening is, over and over again, people lose trust in God. They get that, that, that fear. They get scared of scarcity. They get this fear of lack. And so they begin to trust what is physical, what is tangible. They get, begin to uh, trust what is temporal, not that which is eternal. And every single time as they begin to trust the earth, they begin to trust themselves, they begin to trust idols, they begin to trust things that are tangible, every single time their hearts drift from God. Over and over and over again. And so God realizes, hey, I need to do something. I'm going to do the ultimate act of generosity. And I'm going to send my son. I was talking with, he was here two weeks ago, Pastor Manny Arango and I were talking last night. We talk often, but we were having a conversation. He's preaching actually on generosity at Hillsong Phoenix today. And he was saying, I, he goes, guess what I'm telling him? He goes, I'm going to tell him, hey, if Jesus only tithed 10% of his blood, a lot of us wouldn't be saved. And I was like, oh, 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 right? It's like, oh, Manny, come back and preach that sermon here. Um, like. Boy, that's a, but you think about it, right? What, what, what needed to happen? He came and he tithed all of him. He didn't tithe. He said, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to sacrifice all of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you an example of what generosity really is. There's no greater love than to lay one's life down. So I'm going to give everything I have. And in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes it this way in verses, or chapter 8, verse 9. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Hey, you're poor in spirit. You're poor in health. You're poor in these things. You have a lot of lack in your life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, even though I'm perfect and I'm up in heaven, I've got to figure it out, I'm going to come down. and I'm going to make myself the least of these. I'm going to give my whole life for you so that you can begin to realize that you do not lack anything. That you could begin to realize that with me, you lack nothing. That you could begin to realize that with me, if you would trust me at the level with which I gave to you, with everything that you are, then you're going to begin to realize that I have got you. But you got to stop the withholding. You have to stop the fear. You have to stop the scarcity mentality. 
So really we see this biblical theology of generosity as the reality that there is a God, that he is the God of abundance, but he requires his people to commit to his process for money. He's got a process for this. He's got a way that he asks us to approach it, and that's what I want to help walk us through a little bit today. So, and I want us to remember something when it comes to money. Can we remember that money is amoral? It is not good or evil. It's amoral, okay? It is not evil to have, but how many of you know it can serve you or you can serve it? It can serve God's kingdom or you can serve it. Uh, Jesus actually spoke this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, uh, you cannot serve God, and the actual word was mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon comes from the Greek word uh, mamonos, or I pronounced that wrong, <laughs> and uh, similar, which is similar root words exist in Hebrew, Latin, Aramaic, Chaldean, and Syriac. They all translate to money, wealth, and material possessions. And see, see the Hebrews, they, they actually, the Israelites believed that that the mammon wasn't just stuff, but it was it was almost like a spirit, like something that came over you. That man, like the spirit of mammon, is, is all of a sudden I become obsessed with this fear of lack, this fear of scarcity. So I begin to focus my life on money, wealth, and material possessions. I begin to focus my life on how big of barns can I build? How much can I store for myself so that I am in control? So that I, see, mammon says I've got it. Right? So you cannot serve God because God requires you to trust him. And you cannot serve, you cannot serve God and mammon because mammon requires that you trust it. So what do you trust? Do we trust the stuff or do we trust God? And now that's not a question you can answer easily. Emotionally, you may want to say God. But tangibly, physically, if you if you if we look at our budgets. If we look at our bank accounts, if we look at our time, if we look at our effort, if we look at, which one is it? It's an important distinction to begin to ask ourselves. Man, is, is mammon controlling me? Or am I operating from a place of faith? Is God? And, and serve here actually um, would, would have been heard, um, honestly, as being enslaved. And you can be enslaved to God or mammon. Now, obviously, that word is like, whoa, that's intense. And uh, at this biblical time, slavery looked very different. It was a lot more like indentured servitude where I owed somebody and I got I to gotta work for them and I don't have a choice. Essentially saying I am completely committed. You can't serve two masters. So, so, so which one is it? Are we going to be fully committed to God or are we going to be fully committed to mammon? We can't serve both because it's a heart issue. Earlier on, just before this, in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus tells us, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So if Jesus is after our heart and our heart is focused on mammon, not because you're evil, not because you're terrible, not because you're bad, but because you're human. You see, human nature tells us, hey, we're not promised tomorrow. You better store up. Hey, we're not promised. We got to be real careful here. And this is not a message saying you can't have a savings account, you can't be smart, we should be smart, we should be intelligent, we should use wisdom, and I'll get to that. But the reality of where is the trust, though? Where's our trust? Where is our heart? And this actually stems, Matthew 6.21, actually people who would have been scholars of the word would have understood what Jesus was talking about, because in Isaiah 33, verse 6, there was a prophetic word at the time that says, in that day, Jesus essentially, he will be your sure foundation. Providing a rich store of self. Hear that? A rich store. He's going to provide your storehouse. He's going to provide your barn. He's going to provide the savings. He's going to, he's going to provide a rich store of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord will be your treasure. So when Jesus is talking through parable about storehouses, when he talks about treasure and your heart, when he begins to talk about serving God and serving mammon, he's referring back to Scripture here. He's referring back to the prophet Isaiah. And he's saying, hey, mammon is right here. Mammon, less than, physical, tangible, right in front of you. You can build wealth. You can get possessions. It's not inherently evil. But if your trust is in that, you are going to build something up and you're going to be like this man in this parable who died right after filling his barns. And who gets it now? Where does it go now? What was the value of it now? Because you entrusted your soul to your storehouse rather than to me. Again, he doesn't even say it's inherently evil, but he asks the question, what came of it? 
Was it valuable? Was that a useful way for him to operate? But Isaiah here lays out what it looks like. So you can store up treasure, right? Because he says this, you can store up treasure in, 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 on earth where moth and rust can destroy it, or you can store up treasure in heaven. Actually, Isaiah tells us here in this verse what storing up treasure in heaven looks like. It actually says, so he will be a sure foundation providing a rich store of salvation, living from the reality that you are saved, should transform every part of who you are. We should be fully committed to the reality of the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. It, it, it is actually a part of the treasure that we receive. So we receive salvation. That's eternal. He's offering wisdom, eternal wisdom, saying, hey, I'm actually going to help you go through life with wisdom. I'm going to help. That's part of the treasure. Wisdom is treasure. You're going to be like Solomon. And you're going to be able to see things. And you're going to be able to speak to things and lead through things. And, 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 and I'm going to give you wisdom and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you knowledge. I'm going to give you experience. Knowledge is derived from experiential moments. I'm, from your experience, I'm going to help you to use that. And the fear of the Lord will be your treasure. See, actually, fear, when they read that, they don't mean scared of the Lord. They mean trust in the Lord. Fear of the Lord is connected to trust of the Lord. So, so your treasure is the fact that you trust God. That even if tomorrow I lost everything, I still have all that I need. Because I still have God. My treasure is in the fear of the Lord. It's not in my house. It's not in my savings. All of which, again, are fine. But, but my, my treasure is my trust in the Lord. First and foremost, I trust him. You see, mammon wants to swap salvation, the treasure of salvation, for an earthly storehouse. Hey, you can save yourself. Make enough money and you're good. Come on. Just build it up. Just store up that just keep, how far can you go? You see this right now with the world's richest list. It's like, man, they just keep chasing something bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like, man, our, everyone's panicking. The earth's dying. Let's go to Mars, right? The earth's dying. Let's not fix it. Let's just go to Mars. Let's just go find another planet. Let's just, let's just move on. Let's just go find a place where we're safe. Let's go find a place where we can build storehouses big enough. Let's fight the decaying of our bodies with everything we can, as much surgery and as much work as we can do to fight the decay, let's, you know, we can solve this. I don't need salvation. I need a storehouse. I will, I will build a storehouse that will save me. It's the lie of the enemy. And then he says wisdom, but mammon actually says swap wisdom and live wastefully. There's nothing more wasteful than constantly spending on temporary things. Uh, it's pretty gross. I, I should have done more research and had more stats on the amount of food waste. Every, every um, food distribution center in our city that I've talked to, they do not have a food problem. They have a distribution problem. There's more wasteful food that they are given than they know what to do with. It's getting it in the hands of people. Because, right, it, grocery stores have to have perfect-looking food. Everything has to be flawless. And the amount of waste that is happening in our world, is, that's the spirit of mammon. Hey, we're okay with waste. We're okay with waste. That's okay. It's fine to be wasteful because we're... We want it a certain way. That's all right. So we swap wisdom for waste. Wisdom says, hey, how do we maximize everything we have? How do we utilize every bit of resource and do more with it and multiply it and steward it and advance it and, and make more of it? And it's not wasteful. It's stewardship. It's wisdom. Mammon also says swap fear of the Lord, trust in the Lord for, for, this, for this trust, for this fear of, of, of honestly poverty, saying, hey, hey, swap, you trusted the Lord, but now you're trusting your storehouse because you're afraid of, property, of poverty. You're afraid of, of losing everything, and it's a struggle. So really what we have to understand is there is this world of mammon that says more is better. Hey, more stuff, more things, as much as you can get, collect, 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 collect. more is better. And then we see in the Bible this whole biblical narrative, this kingdom of Jesus, where less is more. Saying, hey, I'm going to become less so they can become greater. I'm going to become the least of these. I'm going to come underneath other people. I'm going to support. And I'm going to lead up. And, and so with this understanding of, of biblical generosity, let's, let's look just a little bit deeper here in the time that we have as to why financial generosity is, is so vital to the way of Jesus and his kingdom. I actually think that it's a huge part 
of the gospel message of Jesus being attractive to other people. You see, I just don't see stingy people as being attractive. Like, like right? I, I, just, I just don't see that. And, and the reality is that I, I really believe this. Financial generosity is attractive relationally. So seriously, you like a friend that gives generously. <laughs> I love a friend that gives good gifts. I'm like, come on. Yes, <laughs> you know me. Come on, speak my love language. Uh, give me some, like, right? We love a friend that's generous. We love somebody that picks up the tab. We love somebody that gives above and beyond. Nobody doesn't like that person. It's like, man, I want to be around them. Because we live in a world where we're constantly questioning people's motivation. But all of a sudden, it's hard for me to challenge that you're, oh, bro, that, that cash app you sent me for that 200 bucks to help me out in a tight spot, man, your motivation must be terrible. How dare you give me $200? What was your real motivation in giving me? No, you're just like, thank you, 200 bucks to help me with my car repair. I needed that. That's awesome. You don't, you don't question the heart of that person. You don't question the motivation. You're like, whoa, that's amazing. That must have come from some good in you. There must have been something good in you that would make you, allow you to be so generous to me. We don't question it. Essentially, when we give, give and we're generous and we live a generous lifestyle, you either gave it or you didn't. The motivation becomes way less important. And, and, and if actions speak louder than words, what a great action for Christians to be known by. Man, that, that church is just so generous. You run into somebody from Artisan, man, they're going to bless you. They're going to find a way. They're going to go out of their way to love you, to give to you, to, to support you. Beautiful thing is there's so many ways now that we can creatively be generous. We don't have to slip them a 20, right? They, they door dash them a gift card, you know. We can, we can do all sorts of things that we say, hey, I'm going to find a way just to help you. I'm going to be a blessing to people. It speaks volumes. It, it's so attractive relationally. So if it's attractive relationally to other people, speaks volume to people and, and speaks to the motivation of your heart, I wonder what does your money then say about your relationship to God? What, what, what does our money say? About, are we putting it first? Does it say I'm, I'm in it for me? Or does it say, hey, I trust in God because I'm giving him my best. I'm giving to him first. I'm, I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and I'm, and I'm saying, God, I trust you. You see, this whole idea of lack, it's really a disease. It's contagious. It's actually one of the things that I was just talking to somebody, a newer member in our church, and he started a nonprofit that's, that's working towards helping to break off the generational mentalities of lack in certain people. Saying, hey, we're going to actually help them to see money different. We're going uh, to approach this from a different thing because how many of you know it even gets passed down generationally that huh, there's never enough. Cupboard's always empty. There's not enough out there. Everything's running dry. Everything's falling apart. We're never going to make it. We don't have it, right? This gets contagious. It becomes, have you ever been around people paranoid all the time? Always stressed, always stressed. All, and you start to go, ah, ah. Like, ah, I just, I want to get away. I just can't handle it. It drives me crazy. And it just, it, it becomes this disease. It becomes contagious. But the same thing can be said about people who understand abundance. You ever been around some people who are really generous? who believe that there's abundance on the other side tomorrow, that there's more, that there's God's got it, that there are resources, that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, that there is more out there, that believe in how much more, not less than. Have you ever gotten around some people like this? I remember a really valuable trip happened in my life when I was, I think I was 18, and I had a, a youth leader. I just graduated high school, and there was a youth leader that um, he was the kind of guy that he understood abundance. He, he just lived his life in a way he was highly generous at every opportunity. He was the kind of guy that, that just, he, he lived different. And, um, and, and one of the things that he was really into is he really into cars. Come on, I love a good friend with some good cars, right? I'm like, let me drive. <laughs> let me try. Um, and, uh, and he had just, uh, and, and he, he, he was actually, he was in the world of cars and car sales, and that was a lot of what he did. And, and he was actually moving, and uh, he was moving to Atlanta. And he said, hey, hey, I actually, I'm driving the moving truck, and I just bought a brand new BMW 6 Series. And, uh, and I need someone to drive it from Minneapolis to Atlanta. You want to do it? <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Because 
because I'm driving a 1991 Volkswagen Jetta and I painted the rims orange and it clanks around while I drive. And and are you sure? Like, are you sure? Like my clutch was like clipped together, no joke, with a clothespin. Like I had tied my clutch cable back together, and I'm like, you want me to drive that car? And so he's like, yep, I want you to do it. I want you to drive this BMW 6 Series down to Atlanta. So, so, so the day comes, and he gives me the keys, and he says, bring it down there. And, um, and I, actually, I actually convinced him to let me uh, have it a day early, and I actually was able to take someone on a date in the BMW 6 Series. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good friend, right? This is a good friend. Sorry, babe, it wasn't you. Um, it was before you. It didn't work out. It was a terrible date. It was just one date only. Um, and... <laughs> and and so so the day comes I'm supposed to drive it to Atlanta so I load up and uh, at the time like I remember like snapback hats were really inside this purple snapback hat on and uh, my obnoxious like skater outfit and I get in this BMW 6 series and I start driving to Atlanta I'm having the time of my life I mean this thing's got the chair massagers right like it's massaging your back it's cooled and heated it's got everything this thing is tricked out you know it's got the full um, so the whole roof is like one big moon roof, and you could open it up. It felt like a convertible. When you, I mean, this thing was sweet. And I am cruising, and I, I'm going to be honest. I was so careful. I'm, like, I'm not going to speed. I'm just little moments, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I'm just driving, and I'm going along and making my way down to Atlanta, and I, I turn on my blinker, and, uh, and I start to exit, and all of a sudden a cop pulls up behind me, and the lights go on. And I was like, I don't think I was speeding. Like, I would not have taken a chance with this, with this car, and I, and I pull over, and, and, and in this gas station, and he pulls up behind me, and, and he doesn't get out, and I'm like, what's going on? And I'm sitting there waiting, and I'm pulled over, and he's like, not getting out, and all of a sudden, four other cop cars come with their sirens going, and I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> this doesn't look good, and, uh, and so then they all get out and, and, and have me leave the car, and they get out of the car, and they're like yelling at me. They're like, Duh. like they're, they're intense. And they're like, what are you doing with this car? And I'm like, I'm driving it to Atlanta for my friend. Like, he, he, they're like, you have no business being in a six series. There's no way you afforded this car. I'm like, it's not my car. Here's his insurance, right? I'm trying to tell them, like, why is this punk kid in a brand new BMW 6 Series? All of a sudden, they, they bring out the dogs. And the dogs are sniffing. They are digging through this whole car. They're going through this full inspection. And as I'm doing this, I go, officer, wh what's going on? Like, what did I do? And he's like, he, he, he goes, well, we actually, we, we think you're smuggling drugs. And I was like, Psh, officer, come on. I'm a church kid. Like, my friend asked me to drive this. I didn't smuggle drugs. He goes, I actually believe you might think that. He goes, but actually, that's one of the number one ways that people smuggle drugs across state lines is they ask a friend to drive their car while they're moving, and they're really having drugs in their car. And all of a sudden, in this moment, I'm going, wait, what does he do for a living again? <laughs> like... I think, like, am I smuggling drugs? <laughs> like, and I don't know it. Yeah, why is he letting me drive this BMW 6 here? He's like, hold on. And I start to panic. Like, my heart starts to beat, right? And, uh, and no, they did not find any drugs. And they let me on my way, and I arrived safely in Atlanta. But there was this moment, right, where you're like, oh, no. <laughs> it's like, it's in for me. But this whole experience over the, la the months leading up to it, and even that, was actually, believe it or not, a profound moment in my life, not because I thought I was going to prison for a couple minutes there, but because of the way that this man of God led his life. He was just the kind of guy that he would invite you to his birthday party at Fogo de Chao, and he'd take the whole bill. And it's like, it's your birthday. It's like, no, I want to bless you guys. I want to take care of you. He was abundant in generosity, but more than that, he seemed to always have faith for tomorrow, that more was coming, and he was highly generous to the local church. He was highly generous. And something, when I was around him, I remember thinking at 18, like, man, I want to be like this. I, I want to be like this. I, I want I want to, I this is contagious for me. The, the, the mentality, the way he's living, like, I, I just, I don't know, man, if I could be like this, this would be amazing. And, 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 and all of a sudden it just started to make, help me realize that his financial generosity showed to me that he believes in how much more, not less than. He believes in a God who's going to take care of it, and, hey, we're going to move the kingdom. It was attractive. And I would watch as, like, servers at restaurants would get saved around this guy. Why? Because he tipped them really good. <laughs> so they'd listen to what he'd tip them really good, and then he'd tell them about Jesus. And I'm just like, man, there's something on this guy. There's something in it. You see, less than believes there is never enough. How much more believes there is more than enough? 
I want to read a verse here as we end, as the band comes on up. A couple, couple things here, a couple things. Let's actually start with this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. I want to give you a very tangible example in the New Testament of a local church. This is speaking about a collective, a community of believers who understood this tension around generosity. Paul writes to the church in Corinth about the church in Macedonia. And he says, now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy, man, is that not attractive or what? Overflowing joy in the midst of a severe trial. That's a whole sermon right there. I could start preaching for 30 minutes straight with no notes on that one verse. Man, their overflowing joy in the midst of a severe, a severe trial. And their extreme poverty, I don't even understand this verse fully. I've been studying it. I still don't grasp the, the layers of it. And their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. How does that work? How can you be generous and in poverty? Maybe because abundance isn't about a number, a numerical value. Maybe because believing in how much more is not always determined by our current circumstances. Maybe because it's a more of a heart issue than a tangible physical issue. Maybe because it's more about the overwhelming joy that we're to exude in each and every situation regardless of what's happening around us. We're supposed to put our faith and our trust in a God of more. A God who's got us. A God of abundance, not a spirit of lack that's trying to attack us. So their poverty he wells up in generosity. So Paul himself says, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able. Church, I want to let you know, God is never going to ask you to give more than you're able. Ever. For they gave as much as they were able. That's got to be some freedom for somebody in this place. Hey, as much as you're able. God's asking for only that which you're able and then, but they chose, they went even beyond their ability. And that's who I want to be. What's beyond my ability? What am I believing for that I can't make happen when it comes to generosity? What am I believing for that I can't make the numbers work? What am I committing to, to serving, blessing, giving, offering? What, what, what am I committing to that's even beyond it? Because I want to be more like the church in Macedonia. Right? It wouldn't have been sin for them to only give what they were able, but they chose because they had overwhelming joy. Even in a place of poverty, they gave beyond what they were able. What does that mean? They gave to the point that it hurt them. Like, like they gave to the point where they felt it really hard, strong. Man, if we give that, though, what about tomorrow? Yeah, what about tomorrow? We serve a God who's God much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded us. Oh, oh, come on, catch this in your spirit. Oh, the presence of God is here right now, online and in the room. But I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. A.K.A. Paul said, hey, you're in poverty. You're hurting you don't have to give to this offering for the church. Like, you don't need to be a part of it. And they said, oh no, you're not going to steal that from us. Oh no, we're going to sow in. Oh no, we're going to give beyond our ability. Oh no, you're not going to withhold from us. No, we want to be a part of it. Because we want to share in service to the Lord's people. And what did they do? They exceeded the expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And then by, and then by the will of God also to us. And there's an order here. There's an order here. First to the Lord, then to others, and then they trusted God for themselves. So I give first to God, then I give to others, and then I trust Him for me. Abundance is found through our priorities. They gave themselves in order. Lack will always lack. Listen, listen, listen. listen. Lack will always demand to be first in line. I got to cut into the front because what if the soup runs out? I need food. I got to be first in line. I got to be the first one. I want to go first to make sure I get what's due to me. I want to make sure I get mine. I want to make sure I get my slice of the pie. So I got to cut. I got to work my way to the front. 
lack demands to be first. To finish first, to eat first. Well, abundance is always okay with going last and offering our best. I'm okay with last. I actually am called to be like Jesus and to go last. You eat first. You eat first. You get in line first. You go ahead. And I'm going to trust God with the rest. I'm going to put everyone else before me. 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 9, verse 10. This is the next chapter here. Paul says this. Now he, God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now here, we see something we're able to store. Seed. So we're not supposed to store crops, but we can store seed. And catch what's happening here. Now he who supplies seed to the sower or bread for food. What do you want, church? Do you want bread? Because bread, you can eat right now. Like right now, in this moment, it's ready. Bread. You can eat it. Go ahead, Pastor Eric. You can eat that bread. It's yours. You can eat it in this moment, right? I can take a bite. I can eat it. Now, this is the really fake, spongy white bread, so this pretty long shelf life, right? But how many of you know this can't be multiplied? It's bread. I can eat it. I can consume it. And now it's gone. It's over. It's a limited quantity. There's just one loaf. I can think creatively on how what I want to do with it. I can figure it out, but eventually this bread is going to run out or it's going to get moldy. It's going to get compromised. It's going to get trampled underfoot. Is it, what good is it anymore? Seed, on the other hand, seed has limitless potential. Because I can plant it. It can grow. It can produce more seeds, which I can then plant, and then grow more plants, which produce more seed that then I can plant, and then I can grow more plants, which produce more seed, and I can make a whole lot more bread out of the grain that I choose to multiply. So God is offering today, hey, do you want seed or do you want bread? Because he'll give you bread. He will. Do you want bread? Cool. He will provide bread those that are hungry, but if you would be a sower, he'll give you seed. And if you would store up seed, there is literally limitless potential on what God can do. But time and time again, resources come into our life, and what do we choose to do with them? We eat them. We eat them. We're saying, this is bread. I like bread. If you want it to be seed, you have to invest it. You have to give it. You have to release it. You have to let it go. You have to give it back into the kingdom of God. And if you would do that, you're going to produce a harvest so much greater than what you could ever do if you would just eat it. So church, today, everyone stand across this room. We're going to worship for a moment. What do you want? Do you want seed or do you want bread? Bread says I'm worried about lack and I need it right now. Bread says less than. Bread says immediate. Seed. Seed says I believe in how much more. It's going to take some work. Seed takes effort to sow. Seed's a process. But I want seed. Everything that comes into my hands, I'm going to ask God, what do you want me to do with it? Where is this supposed to go? How am I supposed to invest it? What am I supposed to accomplish with this? What does this look like? And I believe that we could be a church that might just well up in generosity like the Macedonian church that goes, we're not looking for bread. We want seed. We want to multiply back into other churches. We want to launch churches. We want to invest in the kingdom of God. We want to send out missionaries. We want to reach communities. We want to reach the world. We don't just want to eat all the resources. We want to give it back. We want to be a church that is a storehouse of seed. So in Jesus' name, I just pray all across this room that you would speak to us right now. Would you challenge our hearts on ways in which we've been choosing to eat bread? And would you show us what it looks like to see our resources as seed? Would we see you as a God of abundance who's got more for us? Jesus, would we not let that spirit of lack 
get on our church or get on our lives or get on our children or get into our homes. But Lord, would we believe that you've got it? You own a cattle on a thousand hills. God, we need you in this moment. Come on, would you begin to just worship him?